On Thursday, a former chief investigator at the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center is accusing the Pentagon of blocking publication of his book on the use of brutal interrogation techniques. Mark Fallon, an NCIS veteran, said his book, Unjustifiable Means, reveals no classified information. He said his book only details internal deliberations about interrogation methods and identifies officials who advocated torture. In an interview with Reuters, Fallon said, This is more of an inside view of the fight to try to stop torture. everyone here will read your book. Uh, I think it's it's a very compelling read and it's uh, it's a really remarkable investigation. And can I just add, if you don't read it, just buy it anyway. It's, I think, really a powerful look at what it means to be an American citizen who cares about justice. And I have some questions, but it sounds like before I ask questions, you yeah, I just wanted to, to make a comment uh, about how grateful I am to be here with you uh, today and some of you yesterday. You guys got in trouble, got sent to the front row. What did you guys do? <laughs> uh, and, and, and so it's really been a, a delightful experience uh, for me. Uh, and I appreciate, uh, Dan, what you do and, and what this school does uh, and, and the center uh, that you guys have established uh, together. And, and so uh, I, I thought, is there some kind of token a gift that I could give you um, uh, coming here. And so I thought of what might be appropriate for you. When you bought so many books, I thought that you needed a, a bag uh, to put your, your, your book in and carry it around. So here's uh, your, your very own Unjustifiable yes. Means bag. So. There's, also, there's also, I'd point out, a bag on the cover of the book. But I won't. Uh, it must this just be a coincidence. Will, this will that be for different too. different purposes. I, well, I in the privacy of your own home, you can do what you want. So, uh, <laughs> I guess I am a liberal. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I want to make sure I leave plenty of time for everyone here to, to ask questions. Can you tell us just sort of tell everyone here a little bit about your career path, how you got started, you know, how you became an NCIS investigator? Yeah, sure. Um, to me, it was a calling. I mean, growing up as a kid, I always wanted to be a crime fighter. I always wanted to kind of stand up for the good guys and, and stand against the bad guys. Uh, and, and my father was a police officer detective. Uh, my grandfather was a councilman and a police commissioner. Um, my father's partner was a guy named Jimmy Dyer. His wife was named, jo his daughter was named Joanne, and I married her. So I married the, 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 the daughter of my father's partner. Um, my nephew was a detective in New Jersey. So when you talk about blue bloods, uh, I'm one of those blue blood families that, 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 that bleeds uh, my veins, blue blood goes through my veins, at least it looks like it. Um, and, and, and so um, even when I was uh, going to college um, many moons ago, uh, I started working as a uh, a beat cop in Old Line, Connecticut, uh, walking a beat and doing patrols, and, and that's when I realized I really didn't like the uniform. I wanted to kind of go more into plain clothes type 
uh, in law enforcement and, and finished my degree and, and then became a deputy U.S. Marshal in 1979. And then um, I had very little knowledge of the military. I mean, I didn't come from a military family, although my father and uncle served during World War II. Um, so, some folks uh, in the Marshal Service uh, told me how great an organization, they were calling it ONI, the Office of Naval Intelligence, uh, and then it used to be called NIS after that, now it's NCIS. Um, and, and so uh, I was kind of recruited into the organization, um, and it's a, a very unique organization. Uh, in my opinion, there's no other uh, like it, uh, um, bar none. Uh, it, it's a hybrid organization that has evolved from a counterintelligence organization uh, to a criminal investigative organization. Um, and, and the Navy and Marine Corps do it much differently than the other services, uh, where uh, years ago, um, the, the Navy and the Marine Corps decided that they were sailors and they were, and they were riflemen, and that they needed to hire civilian professionals to provide a capability to the Navy and Marine Corps that weren't their core competencies. Uh, Marines are good at shooting rifles and sailors are good at sailing ships. Um, but so, so they hired uh, civilian professionals uh, to work at the time were naval intelligence districts. Um, and so uh, I worked for an organization that then evolved from a counterintelligence organization to add criminal investigations to that mission or to that profile that reported back to a civilian chain of command. Uh, so while I was deployed with the fleet uh, and, and I worked with and provide services to those generals and admirals and commanding officers and, and, and forward deployed uh, and, and folks deployed in this country, um, my reporting chain of command was independent back to a civilian director, uh, to a civilian secretary of the Navy uh, to try to avoid undue military influence, undue command influence over what should be an independent investigative effort. Um, and, and so in 1981, um, as a kid who grew up uh, five miles outside of Manhattan, had never flown in a plane before I was a deputy marshal, uh, who thought the West Coast was looking across the Delaware River of Pennsylvania, um, I wound up in this job uh, that sent me to places like Afghanistan and Iraq and Pakistan and Yemen and Iceland and Australia and all over the world. So, so for me, um, it was a dream come true. Uh, I was able to do things I never envisioned I would and provide support uh, to our country uh, for the Navy and Marine Corps, particularly trying to protect sailors and Marines and their families and property. So can you tell us a bit about sort of the kinds of work that you were doing? And we'll start with sort of the, the period. I know everything changed on September 11th, but in the, in the couple decades before that, in the 1980s and the 1990s, what, what Besides sort of traveling the world, uh, what, what types of things were you working on? Yeah. Was there anything in particular you were especially proud of? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, th the, the nice part about the mission of NCIS, who watches the television show? <laughs> who watches the show? <coughs> Come on, more you do. <laughs> right, say it's, it's the most popular dr television drama in history. Um, and it's interesting because Don't I... thanks to any of you. <laughs> I used to have to explain to people what NCIS was, and now I have to explain what NCIS isn't. Um, and, 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 and so, uh, well, while the show's great when I used to watch it, um, uh, I actually don't, don't watch it anymore and for no particular reason. It's not my style show. Uh, but but um, it, it portrays a piece of the mission. And so early in my career, uh, I started in 1981 with uh, NCIS, or called NIS at the time, in Brooklyn, New York. And so as a little baby agent, a little young agent, cutting my teeth, working with NYPD and Brooklyn South Narcotics and uh, Organized Crime Bureau, uh, I spent uh, a lot of my time undercover. And, and so back then, um, the military was still plagued with drug issues uh, back in the early 80s and late 70s. Um, and, and I was at a period where NCIS was looking to hire what we would affectionately call some more door kickers. And, and, and so coming from the U.S. Marshal Service, uh, uh, you know, part of why I was recruited was, here's a guy who probably kicked some doors for us. And, 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 and so the goal was then to try to infuse 
uh, more of uh, a law enforcement influence into an organization that's culturally was more counterintelligence related. And there's overlapping uh, issues involved, but, but there's two different purposes and further evolved to a, a counterterrorism organization. So, so back in those days, uh, in the 80s, um, um, I spent time buying drugs, buying guns, selling drugs. As one does. Yeah. Well, now it's like blood pressure medication. And, although I bought a lot of marijuana, maybe there's a new market for me. I can go back on the street and pharmaceutical marijuana in California. Maybe I can come here and work in Colorado. Uh, and, and, and so um, uh, early on, uh, 1983, uh, I was sent to the Philippines. Uh, Subic Bay was the largest uh, uh, military installation, uh, uh, I think probably in, maybe in history. I know it was the largest at the time. And, and so there was Subic Bay Naval Station and QB Point Naval Air Station, and that was the hub for the Seventh Fleet, the U.S. Seventh Fleet, uh, for the South Pacific. Um, and, and that's where um, I was assigned doing what's called out-country drug operations, um, particularly after I was did enough in-country drug operations where I was known um, uh, to, to the, the, the locals. Uh, and, and part of that mission was not only to buy drugs or, or try to suppress uh, narcotics or do narcotic interdiction operations, um, it was also to collect intelligence while I was doing it. And, and so while we were doing criminal investigations, we were also reporting on what the possible threat potential would be for the fleet while we were doing it. And so I would go to places like Thailand and, and buy drugs and uh, Hong Kong and I've uh, been to Taipei and Pakistan and Kenya. And, and, and so you would look at what type of crimes might be impacting the fleet uh, and then try to figure out how you could interdict that or suppress that. And so um, I, I'm, my, my, my kids kind of laugh when they see pictures in my, in my man cave, you know, my love me wall of, of things of me like with cheetah skins and, and elephant tusks because and I did anti-poaching operations, so I went undercover doing safaris, not shooting animals uh, with guns, but with a camera. But buying uh, cheetah skins and elephant tusks from poachers, because it's still it was illegal to do that, to, to try to make them afraid to sell to Americans. So when the fleet came in, they would be weary of Americans, and we take some of those people that will be more prone to sell to Americans off the streets by working operations. And that's the whole purpose of. Uh, of those drug operations, those narcotic suppression operations, was to go into a port before a ship came in and, and, and to work with the locals and to do some high-level arrests so the locals are hot and happy, uh, but a lot of low-level arrests in high-publicity areas so that people would be afraid to sell to the sailors when they got there. And so we would time the operations to do the arrest, usually just when the fleet arrived there. And so that's what I did uh, for a number of years, traveling through mostly Southeast Asia, uh, doing those sorts of things. Uh, so that was kind of the early 80s. I went through a period where I worked uh, contract fraud, or white collar crimes. Uh, I've gone through periods where I've worked double agent operations, uh, things like that, uh, in, in done, I've done storefront operations, uh, where you're buying stolen property uh, and things like that. Uh, and, and then in the 90s is when I started getting uh, more involved with kind of the, the more uh, what people would call the Islamic related uh, uh, violent extremism or, or terrorism. Uh, when I was in the Philippines, I worked uh, a lot against what's called the New People's Army uh, there. Uh, they had the spower unit assassination squads uh, that would kill people. And so part of the uh, drug effort was also to collect intelligence on the New People's Army uh, and, and then targeting uh, U.S. personnel uh, in the Philippines and, and throughout Southeast Asia. So, so that was kind of early on, uh, prior to the 90s, kind of the things I was, I was involved in. And then during the 90s, it shifted more and more into counterterrorism type of work. Yes, so um, uh, an interesting kind of transformation for a military criminal investigative organization. And so for uh, NCIS, there, there's not a lot of NCIS agents. It's a very elite cadre of professionals. Uh, and, and I don't think uh, in, since I first became an NCIS agent in 1981 until I 
left for Homeland Security in 19 or 2008. Um, uh, there's never been more than uh, a thousand NCIS agents in the world. Uh, and so it's a very small, there's usually about 800 or so, uh, and a lot of that work is overseas. Uh, because you have U.S. law enforcement in the country, but you're trying to protect sailors and Marines forward deployed, as well as on all, all the, the military uh, bases and installations with the Navy and Marine Corps. Um, and, and so in the uh, early 90s, I was assigned to Philadelphia. Uh, which was at the time uh, a, a big Navy town. Um, and uh, I had, a, uh, we NCIS had an asset, uh, and it's been declassified now. Uh, his name was Garrett Wilson. Um, and, and he actually was able to penetrate um, a, a group uh, that was Al Qaeda affiliated. And I didn't even know what Al Qaeda was back then. Didn't know that was the name of this group. To me, they were just bad guys looking to do bad things, and, and so I had an asset that was able to get close to these guys uh, and provide intelligence that we passed on to the Joint Terrorism Task Force in New York, and we wound up interdicting uh, an operation that was sanctioned by the Blind Sheikh, Omar Abdel Rahman, who just recently died last year in a prison. He was doing a, a life sentence there. Uh, but he was a spiritual advisor for Al-Qaeda, uh, for Bin Laden before that. Uh, he was in Egypt, a spiritual advisor for the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. And, and so uh, the asset we worked with sold uh, the cannon fuses and some remote control ignition systems that were, uh, they were going to use to blow up uh, the Holland Lincoln tunnels and the federal building, United Nations things. So, um, I, you know, I was getting more involved in uh, terrorism within the United States. Uh, and then the first trade center happened at the same time. Uh, with, with the bombing of the first World Trade Center uh, back in 93, I guess it was. And, and so we were able to, with our asset, through photos, identify uh, who some of the players were uh, that were picked up on, on uh, surveillance and other things. And so I was kind of thrown um, into an area uh, that I don't want to say I was uncomfortable with, but was unusual for NCS working in the States uh, against the terrorist target. We were more uh, looking at doing that uh, overseas. Uh, and, and so if you fast forward to 2000, uh, after that, uh, I was assigned as the assistant special agent in charge uh, for the NCIS field office Europe. Uh, and that was headquartered at Naples, Italy. And that encompassed everything from Iceland to Bahrain. So for one of you I know has a military background, uh, that would be the fifth and sixth fleets air responsibility. So everything kind of from the Atlantic uh, uh, um, on that side of the globe. Uh, and, and so um, at the time, uh, I, I uh, was working more uh, looking at trying to protect the fleet from threats. So my, my job was more, particularly the Middle East, looking at threat warning information. Uh, because NCIS um, also houses uh, the capability to do threat warning information for the fleet. And so it was, again, this evolutionary process within the Navy and Marine Corps uh, that occurred after the Marine Corps barracks was bombed in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, and, and what the, the Navy and Marine Corps found was there was actually predictive intelligence of a potential attack. And there were members of the intelligence community that had that information. But there was not a good mechanism to get that information to the fleet. Uh, and so there was not good processes to take that information from the intelligence community and send it to those forward deployed Marines or forward deployed sailors uh, around the world. And so uh, the first threat warning capability within the government came uh, when the Navy uh, came back to NCIS and I asked the time and said, you need to establish this capability. And they established what was called the ATAC, the Anti-Terrorism Alert Center. And so that is, was co-located at NCIS headquarters. That has evolved now to the MTAC, the Multiple Threat Alert Center. And so if you watch a show and you, you look at the place, it looks like a big sports bar with all those screens on it, uh, showing everything. Of course, when anybody walks in, we turn the lights on and you put ESPN on them. But when those, when it's a, a secure facility called the SCIF, uh, it is monitoring different threads of intelligence globally to try to protect the fleet. And that is the threat warning capability uh, uh, that, that the, the Navy and Marine Corps has. And, and so um, from Italy, 
um, I thought I was coming back to San Diego. Uh, to San Diego, I was told, hey, you're going to be the assistant special agent in charge at the Southwest Field Office headquartered in, in San Diego. And I thought, wow, great, nice weather. I uh, haven't spent a lot of time on the, on the West Coast. I started looking at where I should live out here in schools. I had two kids by that time. Uh, and then uh, prior to getting those orders, uh, because I've only traveled when I've been ordered to travel, the government says you travel orders, it's not a travel request. It's not a travel recommendation. They're called orders for a reason. And you have a choice. I mean, in NCS, I always had a choice. You could quit or be fired. Or you could go. And I just always chose to obey those orders and go. Um, but the uh, assistant director for counterintelligence said, uh, I want Fallon at headquarters. And so I became what was called the chief of counterintelligence operation for the Europe, Africa, Middle East divisions of NCIS. So, so now my principal job was running counterintelligence operations and collecting intelligence uh, to try to protect sailors and Marines while we're deployed in those areas of responsibility. The, the, we, NCIS would break the globe down for most things in three areas. CONUS, and you have, uh, and, and at that time, fifth and sixth fleets, and then you have the, uh, the Westpac. And so I had, I had those areas under my responsibility. And so the USS Cole was attacked uh, on October 12, 2000, um, uh, when I was the Chief of Counterintelligence Operations. So um, I became the commander of the USS Cole Task Force. So my job then went to investigating the attack on the coal jointly with the FBI to bring terrorists to justice uh, through what we thought would be a federal court. Uh, we call them Article Three courts. Article Three of the Constitution establishes that court system or potentially to foreign courts. Because uh, at the time, uh, we didn't know these, these offenses occurred in Yemen, whether we would actually get the suspects out of Yemen or not, or that the Yemenis would try those as a sovereign uh, country. So while we were jointly working with the FBI in the investigation, our job as collectors was still to collect intelligence to disseminate the fleet. And so when we would interview someone or talk to them, we were both documenting that the results of that uh, interview uh, for a potential trial before some judicial body. So we're doing it for evidentiary purposes, as well as then taking that same information and disseminating that information because it is intelligence and possibly action intelligence. Some of it was action intelligence. So, so the goal was to do both, to do an investigation, to do an intelligence collection operation, so that we can disseminate that information to the broader intelligence community to try to protect my job as sailors and marines, but you know the broader Department of Defense and and, and our country uh, through those uh, through those mechanisms. So, so so that was prior to September 11. And then you mentioned sort of September 2001. You were actually so you were in England about to deliver a presentation uh, related to some of some of your findings, and then. Yeah, yeah, incorrect. So, so um, you know, for someone um, within the Department of Defense to have um, the level of the depth of knowledge I had uh, with particularly Al Qaeda was unusual, because the FBI had been the prime is, is the primary agency in the government to investigate terrorism, and and so they had the primary jurisdiction, as we would call it for that, and we were supporting those efforts uh, up until after September 11. Uh, so so uh, one of the things that, that uh, I was doing as the commander of the Coal Task Force and the Chief of Counterintelligence Operations for uh, NCIS uh, was the Chief of Naval Operations um, had me uh, briefing foreign uh, Chiefs of Naval Operations when they visited the U.S. Uh, to try to explain to them what we learned from the coal attack, how a terrorist cell would set up, um, how they do cutouts, um, how they do casing operations, how they recruit people, um, how they set up safe houses, because we learned a tremendous uh, amount uh, from that investigation. Um, and so uh, the DOD uh, director of counterintelligence, a guy named Dave Burke at the time, who oversaw counterintelligence for all the services, uh, said, and wasn't considered a suggestion, um, I want you to head over and brief the NATO Defense Ministers Conference so that the NATO Defense Ministers are better prepared for how a terrorist cell uh, could, could set up in a foreign port 
uh, that our that our fleet are, is, might be going to, or that we have bases uh, overseas uh, in, in those NATO countries. And and so uh, the conference was uh, uh, later in September. So uh, part of my uh, I was stopping in London uh, to brief. Uh, there was an intelligence center there called uh, the Joint Analysis Center in Molesworth, uh, England, an old uh, Royal Air Force base, uh, which uh, the European Command was processing uh, a lot of intelligence to disseminate. Uh, and so I was stopping in London first. Uh, I was going to brief uh, uh, the Joint Analysis Center and then go on to the NATO Defense Ministers Conference. And I got to my hotel room and turned the television on and, uh, and saw the planes are uh, you know hitting hitting the towers and, and uh, I realized that uh, you know later on as I look back I had actually gone through Dulles uh, and left I may have walked through the same magna magnetometer and security screening that some of those same terrorists did uh, less than 24 hours later um, out of Dulles Airport um, and, and so um, uh, I never made it to the NATO Defense Ministers Conference I was then ordered to and to the head to CENTCOM, the Central Command uh, in Tampa, uh, to try to share with the targeteers because uh, it was pretty clear who did it and they were going to be in Afghanistan. And so I was sent to Tampa uh, and I helped prepare what was called the Counterintelligence Annex to Operation Enduring Freedom and, and to share with the targeteers uh, what we knew about Al Qaeda and what we knew about their safe houses and, and, and things that we learned from the coal investigation. Um, with the warfighter to ensure that uh, there was some degree of lethality uh, in our response and the invasion of Afghanistan with the goal of interdicting uh, the terrorists that attacked us. And so that kind of uh, brought me up to um, uh, kind of the invasion of Afghanistan. And I, uh, um, I, I was there to just prior to uh, the invasion, I think I got home my wife's, I key things to birthdays. My wife's birthday is October 5th, so I got home just before her birthday. I think I was able to take her to her uh, a birthday uh, dinner before things got interesting again in October after after the invasion. And then tell us a bit about that, things getting interesting again after the invasion. So we start detaining people. Um, how do you first sort of learn of, of what approach we're taking? Get yeah. So having worked the plan, the counterintelligence plan uh, for the invasion, uh, the, within the military uh, there's a thing called doctrine. So, so that's kind of the rules that you play by or that you fight by or you go to war by. Uh, and there's war plans and things like that. Um, and, and so um, there's doctrine uh, about how we conduct war. There's actually things called the rules of land warfare. There are rules to war. There are things that we do. With, so what we don't do is we don't use chemical weapons, right? That's a war crime. You know, they're very effective. Chemical weapons can be very effective, but we've decided in war that that's not something that is a fair tool to utilize in warfare. Uh, and, and so there are rules of land warfare. Uh, and, and so part of doctrine uh, is about handling prisoners, obtaining intelligence from them, uh, because we have to exploit prisoners. I mean, when we take someone in custody, we have, to know, we have to try to learn what they know. We have to protect our forward deployed forces. We have to protect the infantrymen, uh, the sailors, marines, the airmen, the, the people on the ground, the soldiers. Uh, and, and so there is methodologies in how to do that. And, and the Army, the U.S. Army, is what's called the executive agency within the Department of Defense for interrogation, interrogation, doctrine. And law enforcement guys are, are a little different, but, but for the intelligence community, Fort Huachuca, Arizona, is the Army Intelligence School uh, where they teach uh, how to do, the military people, how to do uh, interrogations with a, a number of techniques um, that honestly aren't grounded in science. They're more anecdotal, they've kind of been passed down uh, through the years um, and, and so there were rules that we were supposed to play by uh, and so at one point um, and I forget uh, the exact date I think it's in the book um, I remember getting a phone call it was a Sunday and 
the New York Giants were playing the Dallas Cowboys. And the Cowboys, and I'm a Giant fan, and the Cowboys kicked the Giants' butt. The Giants are a bunch of professional football team this year, so we're not going to talk about football. Um, but but um, uh, I, I remember, um, and I had a, a, a secure phone in my house called a Stu or a Steve, so I could actually go in my office and pick up a special phone and take a special key out of a safe and turn it, and the phone would then allow me to talk classified information with people overseas. Uh, and so we would have uh, laptops that also have a capability uh, to communicate classified information. And, and so um, a duty call, I wake up uh, a lot of my life in the middle of the night to respond to some crisis. Aren't you supposed to leave? I'm good. I'm, I'm so engaged. Okay. I, I, know, I know you have an event. So. I will see you in far away. We're And so uh, we had something that we didn't expect. And, and so the call was from the assistant special agent in charge of the Middle East field office in Bahrain. Uh, and he said, uh, we've got uh, an American, and was, you know, t dubbed the American Taliban, John Walker Lynn. We have an American in custody who is fighting with the Taliban. What? This isn't, we didn't plan for this. What do you mean an American? Man? Americans don't fight with the Taliban. And, and, and then they had a, a guy named Hicks in Australia who was also captured. And, and, and um, John Walker then was, was captured at a very inopportune time for him himself. So he was at Majri uh, El Sharif uh, prison. And the first casualty uh, of the war occurred in a prison uprising there. And, and, and uh, a hero died in the service of, of our country, a CIA officer named uh, Michael Spann. And, and so he was killed in that uprising. Um, and, and, and so um, we had uh, Lind and, and Hicks in custody. And so now we're trying to figure out, now what do we do? This wasn't the enemy we planned for. And so what do we do now? And so I was on the phone with the Pentagon, with the uh, chief lawyer for intelligence, saying, you know, we've got to exploit this guy. But uh, we also, I also pulled out in my office, I had the U.S. Code books and the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and said, actually, there's, he can actually be uh, brought in those civilian court-martialed uh, for these offenses uh, going on the battlefield. And it's also a violation of the U.S. law, the U.S. Code. And so we're trying to figure out, what do we do with this guy? I mean, we need to exploit him for intelligence purposes, but there's evidence also. And so we looked to talk to him. And so that was kind of the first real curveball. We said, this adversary um, has some different, a different look than we planned for. And you pulled out the war plans. You pulled out the counterintelligence annex operation during freedom that I helped prepare. Nowhere does it say we're going to have Americans and we have to figure out what to do with those people. Um, and, and so that was kind of the first kind of twist in what we were doing. Uh, and then um, something occurred that I wasn't aware of um, at the time, because I was involved trying to do counterintelligence operations in Afghanistan and with, with the invasion forces. Um, but but um, back uh, at the White House on September 17th, uh, the president issued a memorandum of notification authorizing the CIA uh, to do things that weren't their core competencies, and that's to do interrogations. Uh, that's not what they uh, had done for a living. That's not what they trained for. I know on television they do that, and, and after 9-11 they did get involved, but, but that was not, uh, it is not what the CIA does. They, they, they are collectors, and they recruit spies. I mean, it's not a secret. It's not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, and, and and so that that's that that that's their job and their role, and it's very important. I mean, that's what I did too with NCIS. I recruited assets to give me information, um, and, and so it, it's a critical role. But but they were given uh, a mission that they were untrained for, uh, ill prepared for, and really unsuited for. Um, and, and then on October thirteenth, uh, uh, two thousand one, uh, another. Uh, what I thought was a monument, monumental decision was made by the president. Um, we issued a military order, an executive order, which, of course, carries the power of law, 
where uh, the president said that it would be the responsibility of the Secretary of Defense, who at the time was Donald Rumsfeld, uh, to uh, bring terrorists to justice uh, before a process called military commissions uh, that I had never heard of. Um, and, and the president spelled out uh, that the Secretary of Defense was responsible to investigate anyone who is or was a member of Al-Qaeda, anyone who aided, abetted, or knowingly harbored the Al-Qaeda terrorist network. Um, and that was kind of uh, amazing to me uh, because uh, those Article Three courts that I mentioned, the, the federal court system, had actually been very effective in bringing terrorists to justice. And the FBI had been very effective as an investigative agency, both uh, bringing terrorists to justice and also collecting uh, information from them, intelligence from them. At the time, actually, they did not have a very good mechanism to disseminate that, which was part of the problems we had when we failed to connect the dots on September 11. but that may be another discussion. Um, but that was a, a very interesting paradigm shift for our country uh, because in my mind, uh, in the aftermath of September uh, 11, uh, President Bush, uh, in my opinion, lost, lost faith in the Constitution, lost faith in those constitutional courts established under Article Three of the Constitution, uh, lost faith in the FBI's ability uh, to do their job and to use those federal courts to bring terms of justice, and, and then gave the authority uh, that had traditionally been with the Department of Justice to the Department of Defense to create these military commissions uh, within the Department of Defense system. And so for me, as a career federal agent, uh, to kind of see uh, the FBI uh, kind of neutered, uh, you know, being cast aside for some yet to be determined element in the Department of Defense to run the investigations, uh, against Al-Qaeda, and then for the Department of Defense rather than the Department of Defense, the Justice uh, to take over the responsibilities to bring terrorists to justice for some type of judicial body was unique. What was more startling to me was when that mission came to me. And so I got that order. Uh, it went from the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Army, to the Commanding General of Army CID, Don Ryder, who called uh, Dave Brandt, the Director of NCIS, and Eric Patterson, the commanding general of Air Force OSI, and basically said, I, I can't do this job without you. I need your help. Uh, you guys have more experience, particularly NCIS, uh, investigating terrorists, and so you need to help me uh, do this job. And, and I remember the director sent me down to this meeting, and I went back and went to the executive resource board of NCIS, the senior executives, and sat in the director's conference room, and the director was like, Wait a minute, Mark, are you telling me just what I told you, that the Department of Defense is going to take over the responsibility from the Department of Justice to bring terrorists to trial before some process that we've never done before? Yeah, that's right, boss. And that the Department of Defense is going to take over responsibility chief, as the chief investigators for Al-Qaeda when the FBI has this historic information and have done this for, for years? That's what they're telling me. And he said, you better go down there and help them. And so I, I went down there, um, and, and I was just supposed to help them create this task force because I run a lot of task forces, and let them how to establish it, how to mess the intelligence and the investigations. And then um, General Ryder basically said, uh, will you stay? Uh, will you stay and be my chief investigator? And so I wound up, you know, at the time, being the government's chief investigator for Al-Qaeda, and I did that for uh, almost two and a half years. Uh, and, and so it was a challenge in my lifetime. It, it was trying to create from nothing uh, a capability, uh, working with the Office of General Counsel for the Department of Defense uh, before we had prosecutors, before we had rules of military, right? before I knew what the laws I was investigating were or the elements of those offenses, uh, we were trying to figure out how do we do this job? How do I set up a task force to do this? Where do I put people? Where are my headquarters? What are our methodologies? How do we report this? And, and so it was, uh, believe me, the talk, it was seven days a week. Uh, there were 20 hour days. There was, I was on a mission. Uh, there was, there was uh, um, a, a lot of action uh, going on, uh, but it was my duty, it was a responsibility. And, and so uh, we did establish this Q 
capability called the CITF Criminal Investigation Task Force uh, that had forward deployed units. Um, we were headquartered at Fort Belvoir, Virginia uh, in the Beltway, um, but we had units in Afghanistan um, and in Guantanamo and later in Iraq when we invaded Iraq. Uh, but our whole job was to uh, first try to uh, do preliminary investigations so the president could decide whether he wanted to bring someone to justice for military commissions. So they were called reason to believe determinations. So I would have to actually sign, and I signed the first, I think, dozen or so of these RTBs, these reasons to believe that went to the president, basically say, you know, Mr. President, based on our preliminary investigation uh, and our coordination with members of the uh, federal law enforcement intelligence community, we believe that this person that we have in custody uh, in Guantanamo or in Afghanistan or wherever is subject to those rules that you created, this military order on the 13th uh, of November. Uh, and, and I thought it was uh, kind of monumental. I, like I signed them all with like a different pen and gave the pens because I thought this is kind of amazing. I mean, I am part of this, I'm part of history. I'm actually signing a document that's going to work its way through the Pentagon, through interagency, that will wind up on the president's desk to make a decision whether to bring people to justice before this mythical process time called military commissions. And, and so I looked at it as an incredible opportunity, one for me personally. I mean, uh, for a guy who, you know, set out to fight crime, uh, I mean, to fight it at this level uh, was, you know, kind of a chance of a lifetime. And I felt that while I didn't think the mission should have gone to the Department of Defense, if it had to, I thought I was the right guy for the job. I knew the Department of Defense. I thought that my prior experiences, uh, whether it's working against New People's Army in the Philippines or, uh, or the Blind Sheikh and the coal, that I was fully, I had the competency and the experience to execute that mission to the best of my ability. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, I'm afraid to do this or I don't know how to do this. I knew how to do it. It was just a matter of what resources do I need to get the job done. And so I thought it was an incredible opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, um, I found out uh, within months it was an opportunity to be lost. And so uh, in, in my view, my perspective, uh, based on my experience, uh, we lost the high ground uh, based on that September 17th decision uh, for, uh, to give the CIA the responsibility and the authority to do things that they were ill-equipped to do. And so let me ask you, we'll pause in the, in the timeline, just, just to, if you could talk a little bit about the difference between the, the types of interrogations that are effective, that you are experienced in, that, that actually work, and the types of interrogation that you know, the CIA started doing once it was given that role. Yeah. Um, can, before we go that direction, I, you know, I, I heard what was on the mainstream media, for lack of a better term. Wasn't I thought there was a precedent for enemy combatants? Wasn't that the whole legal philosophy or background for yeah. that approach? Yeah. Or? Well, actually, what 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 we tried to do is not call them prisoners of war. Right, and because that's Geneva. Right, and, and and so what we did is lawyers came up with a number of different labels uh, to put on these prisoners. And, and so we were told, do not call them a POW. First we were called to call them unauthorized belligerents. Uh, that was kind of the term. Uh, and, and then they eventually kind of morphed it in and the lawyer said, okay, we're gonna call them enemy combatants. Was and, a precedent for that though? Um, well, I mean, you know, there was, I don't know if, there, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know if there was some type of legal precedent in the past for enemy combatants. I thought that. I remember the president saying that, but maybe not. But go there, ahead. There were some cases a long time ago. Uh, there were some U-boat, I mean, there was, yeah, there were some Nazi saboteurs that we brought to trial. I forget the name of the case uh, back and when we tried them before this military commission-like process, so that was, but they were uniform. They weren't, uh, they weren't, and they were summarily executed. Oh, okay. Yeah. They were uniform enemy yeah, combatants. Yeah, they were different. I, I'm not aware. I could be wrong, but I mean, I'm not aware of us. This was, uh, this threw us for a loop. I, and this, you know, we're, and just like we threw the British for a loop during the revolution. 
because we weren't in uniforms marching in lines. Really? We were hiding in the woods, you know, shooting muskets from bushes. So we changed the rules of warfare uh, when we became a country. And Asymmetrical. So, so yeah, so, so it, wasn't, it wasn't the enemy we were expecting. Uh, and so it was what, what to kind of do with those people. So that answers your question. Some so in terms of once you, you got these people, and maybe they're enemy combatants, maybe they're not, but did, did, there is reason to believe that they could be. Um, in your view, what's the, the sort of appropriate way to conduct, to, to get information from these people? And how did that differ from what actually happened? Yeah, and, and so um, what, what, happened, what happens in uh, an interrogation, and actually I'm part of uh, an effort with the UN right now. I, I spoke in September uh, when the General Assembly was in session, and I've worked with the Special Rapporteur on Torture, uh, the former one, uh, Juan Mendez, and, and, and I'm working with the, the current one, Nils Melzer, uh, to try to establish uh, universal protocols for investigative interviewing. And, and so internationally, uh, the international community won't even use the word interrogation because it is morphed to mean torture now internationally. Uh, and, and, and so uh, the view, the perspective ha has changed. Now, to me, as a law enforcement guy in the U.S., we interviewed witnesses and we interrogated suspects. So it was always a legal standard. Uh, my methodology was basically the same. The way I practice it was like this. Okay, it's not bright lights and it's not slamming your hand on the desk and it's not them saying, you know, I, not, I guess I use the same... Uh, screenwriters for all the shows because they always <laughs> lawyer up the same way and, and they always you know it, it's always the behaviors are always the same uh, when, when you watch when you watch the, the, the television shows uh, kind of about it um, but um, uh, one journalist uh, Pulitzer Prize winner named Bill Dedman was the first guy to kind of write about me uh, and he talked about uh, the technique uh, that was effective at Gitmo and he talked about french fries and so it was giving a, a prisoner french fries, a detaining french fries. Uh, and uh, I was profiled in the, in the Singapore Strait Times, and they did some video uh, clips of me, and, and they called my methodology uh, the tea and honey method. Uh, and, and so what you learn um, through your career, uh, through trial and error, was that the more pressure I put on somebody, the, the more they resisted, and and the more the respect I gave them, or the, the, the more I treated them with dignity, um, and treated them like a human being, the more willing they would be uh, to give me information. Uh, and, and so what happened was, uh, after uh, September 11th, um, when uh, the CIA had the mission to collect intelligence from prisoners, rather than going to the FBI, who had the most experience doing those interviews, or going to an agency like NCS, or anyone within federal law enforcement who had a history and spent careers talking to people, eliciting information. Um, what they did is they turned to two psychologists, uh, a guy named uh, uh, Bruce Jessen uh, and Jim Mitchell, who had absolutely no experience in interrogations, who had no experience with Al-Qaeda, and who had no expertise in the Middle East. Uh, and Mitchell and Jessen uh, were actually, actually at the time, uh, Mitchell had just retired um, as a SEER psychologist. Now SEER is what's called uh, survive, evade, resist and escape and, and so what had happened was uh, in the 50s there were congressional hearings uh, when John F. Kennedy was a senator and, and so what Congress was looking at was the fact that during uh, the, the, the Korean War um, our service members were actually giving false information uh, and in 1957 an Air Force social scientist named Albert Bitterman had done a study, and the study was called uh, U.S. Uh, Airmen Providing False Confessions. And so what the North Koreans had discovered was they were applying 
techniques that had morphed from the Soviets. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the KGB had used techniques uh, that had morphed to the Chinese, and they used them for different reasons. The KGB were using them uh, to, to actually bring dissidents to trial uh, after they get them to falsely confess. Uh, the Chinese were using them for more propaganda purposes. And, and so uh, the North Koreans had taken these techniques and further refined them. And what the North Koreans had found was that the psychological pressures were more effective than the physical pressures. Uh, and, and so Bitterman did this study about our service members that were giving false information, fabricated information that was being used for propaganda. And, and so those hearings in 1956 uh, in, in and 57 basically said, we need to, one, they, they got on the military because the military was bringing to courts martial service members because they gave more than name, rank, and serial number. And they said, you know, you, you, you're, it's treasonous that you gave up information. And the Congress said, wait a minute, these people were tortured. And, and so they were exploring kind of how that happened. You were just supposed to give your name, rank, and serial number, and you did more than that. And so what they did is they created what's called the SEER program, evolved from that. So what we would do is we would, we would show uh, in a very small dose to our service members, a lot of pilots and special operators, kind of what to expect if you were captured by an enemy, that, a brutal enemy, that does not observe the Geneva Convention. And, and so Jim Mitchell was a psychologist in that program. And, and within that program, psychologists don't administer that stuff. Their job is to monitor it and observe, to one, make sure uh, the military members who are role-playing bad guys don't go too far, because the psychologists call it drift. You will go too far. And you'll do that. And you know, my community, you know, the, the, the government goons who kick doors for a living, I can tell you this. If somebody if somebody had a they have a technique called walling, and if, if you can put someone in a wall this high, well the next guy to try to put him in the wall higher. Because that's kind of what we're that, that that's the caliber of our you know alpha bull mentality when we're, we're operating. And and so the CIA turned to Mitchell and Jessen, who at the time was still in the military. Uh, and they asked them to look at what's called the Manchester document, or it's called the Al-Qaeda Training Manual, which really wasn't that. It was just a document found in Manchester, England. And there's no proof it was actually ever used and employed in the spikes for training. That was just rhetoric that the government created so that you would think we needed to do these techniques. And so Mitchell and Jessen wrote a paper called Counter-Resistance Strategies. And so they said, what we need to do to counter that. And so what the CIA did was they hired Mitchell and they hired Jessen to work for them. And this is all part of the Senate Select Committee of Intelligence Report. It's all in the torture reports. It's not classified. Uh, and gave them, actually their initial contract was $183 million. They only got paid $81 million because the contract was stopped after a Google Rev came to light. And, and, and they realized uh, <coughs> the depravity of what we were doing now was spreading. Uh, but, but so what happened was the CIA, rather than going to interrogation professionals, turned to these two SEER psychologists and said, let's do the SEER program. Uh, and so the EIT program, which stands for Excuses to Inflict Torture, uh, I don't buy into the government's methodology or their terminology where they say it was an enhanced interrogation program. It, it was nothing enhanced about it. All we did is we took the techniques that were applied to our service members that produced false confessions and we did that to our adversaries. And you know what happened? False information. Produced false information, yeah. Uh, and, and so we went down a path, and when I had to stand up is when I saw those same techniques were gonna gravitate to the Department of Defense, and they were coming to Guantanamo. And so that's when I felt an obligation to try to step in and stop it. And I showed students in class today uh, an email that you wrote so, uh, around that time saying, this is the stuff of congressional hearings. History is going to remember this. Um, and I guess one of the things I wanted to talk with you about was just, you know, I, think I, I can understand why at the time for some people it might have felt easier to just go along with what was happening. Um, standing up and taking a courageous stand like you did, um, you know, I, I, I'd imagine it is difficult. Um, can you talk a bit about sort of how and why you 
Yeah, I can tell you the other path would have been a lot easier. Um, it, it was, it was hard. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was, I was in a leadership position, and I, and I, I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. I mean, I, I was responsible for bringing charges to justice. I mean, that was my job. Um, and uh, and so when I saw, and you know, I'd worked with the CIA for years. NCIS, we we coordinate our uh, counterintelligence operations overseas with the CIA, and we coordinate them domestically with the FBI. I mean, we don't operate in vacuum. And so I'd worked with the agency for years, and worked with the FBI for years, I mean, through my whole career. Um, and, and and so um, I knew that um, things were going on um, in sites that. Shouldn't have, it shouldn't be going on. Uh, because while uh, people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and others were not in the OD custody, I was still preparing reasons to believe for the president to gather the information I had to say, hey, Mr. President, this guy was the mastermind of September 11th. Might he be someone we want to actually bring to justice before the court? Uh, and, and so in my mind, um, we in the Department of Defense would eventually get those people. I didn't know at the time that they, uh, there was actually, uh, at least according to the Senate Select Committee of Intelligence, uh, that there was a plan for them never uh, to see the light of day. But I didn't think Americans would do that. I think that our country would, would do something like that. But, but, but so at the, at the time, um, I had seen uh, through that summer um, generals at Guantanamo who wanted to employ the same practices. Uh, to abandon uh, Army doctrine, the Army Field Manual on interrogations that sets the parameters about what you can do uh, and adopt those same things that the CIA was doing. And we knew they were using SEER, and we knew they were using something that we were told was learned helplessness. And I said, learned helplessness? What the heck is learned helplessness? Um, and, and I had operational psychologists working for me. And they said, well, learned helplessness is based on experience, experiments conducted on dogs. Uh, and, and, and so uh, what happened is a guy named uh, Martin Seligman, who was a former uh, uh, president of the APA, the American Psychological Association, he's considered uh, the father of positive psychology uh, uh, by psychologists. Uh, and, and he lives in the uh, suburbs in Pennsylvania outside of Philadelphia. Uh, but anyway, Seligman had done experiments on dogs. And, and what he found was, if you administer electric shocks to dogs indiscriminately, they will learn helplessness. They will come helpless. And they will just become obedient. And they will not even try to avoid those shocks. And, and, and so the theory at the time when he did this was, if you can learn helplessness, maybe we can teach people how not to be helpless. Uh, is what I'm told the theory is. That's not how it was applied. And so when I talk about the EIT program, the enhanced interrogation, as they called it, or as I call it, the excuse to inflict torture, the only enhancement on the methodologies that the SEER techniques applied that the communists were doing to us was now taking this learned helplessness theory and saying if, if we, and they also called it within the Department of Defense, demonstrated omnipotence. So if we demonstrate omnipotence over a human being, they will become compliant, and they will become compliant and do what we say. Um, and they will give up their will to resist. And what we found was uh, they, they did not, not only give up their will to resist, some of them gave up their will to leave. And so we actually killed people in our custody who were undergoing an interrogation uh, in these programs. Uh, and, and so, when I saw uh, uh, back in the summer of 2002, uh, particularly the, the, the email correspondence you, you referred to, uh, I, I remember October 2nd of 2002, because we had identified the 20th hijacker, a guy named Mohammed al uh was at Guantanamo. And, uh, <coughs> uh, and I was amazed that the government convicted other people of being the 20th hijacker, because I know we had one of the 20th hijackers at Guantanamo. Uh, but Al-Qahtani tried to get in the country. Uh, he was stopped uh, at, an, at Orlando Airport. Uh, he was a, a Saudi, um, and a very astute uh, inspector uh, uh, stopped him because he, he had said that, uh, well, 
his instincts were the guy looked like an assassin. Wow. Uh, and, and he said that, and he pieced together, because you get a lot of Saudis with money coming in to, to Disney World, and so a Saudi visitor was very commonplace. Uh, but Katani didn't have credit cards, and he didn't have enough cash to actually pay for his hotel room, go to Disney World, and pay for a flight home. Mm. And he didn't have a return ticket. And so Katani was denied entry in the country. And so what we pieced together uh, through, uh, there were phone records, uh, the phone of Mohammed Atta uh, was, at, was outside the airport. So we learned after uh, Mohammed Atta, the operational commander for this kind of attacks in the country, uh, was waiting for him. And he likely would have been the hijacker uh, on the plane that crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And so um, what's interesting just from a, a tactics, techniques, and procedure perspective, um, the other planes all had uh, a, a, a pilot hijacker and four muscle hijackers, so each of them had five. Uh, the only plane that didn't hit its target only had four. They were missing one muscle hijacker, and that likely would have been Mohammed al Qatani. And, and so when we discovered Qatani was at Guantanamo, um, I said, here's my high value target. I mean, if we're going to bring someone to justice for the missions, uh, and you're not going to give us Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and those other guys who were at sites that I wasn't supposed to know about, uh, we already have Katani. Let's let's bring him justice for military commission. Let's show the world uh, that we can do this fairly and justly, and bring the 20th hijacker to justice. Uh, but at the time, uh, the general down there named Mike Dunleavy uh, was hell bent on uh, using the seer techniques and waterboarding. Uh, they wanted to waterboard him down there. And I don't want to say in his defense, uh, but the CIA was putting out bad information. Uh, that they were getting good information out of Abu Zubaydah. Um, and that's information that, that I knew not to be accurate. Uh, and, and so um, people wanted to all be heroes and wanted to be and save our country. And so the general down there was just hell bent on using these techniques. And, and so much to the degree that he wanted uh, NCIS to investigate other generals uh, because they weren't being harsh enough to prisoners. Uh, he called it giving aid to the enemy. They were giving aid to the enemy because they weren't treating prisoners harshly enough. And I just thought that type of talk was crazy. And I reported him back to his chains of command, and back to the Pentagon, and back to the, the head of intelligence of the Army, and said, you know, you've, got, you've got a loose cannon down there, if you call it the Navy. You've got someone down there. Well, I think he's lost it. I mean, he is, he is wanting to work and have other generals brought before court martial um, for giving aid to the enemy because they weren't mean enough. Um, and, and so um, I then saw on October 2nd uh, a, a person from the CIA come down and explain uh, the waterboarding techniques. Um, and according to the congressional record, uh, not my book, but according to the Center Armed Service Committee hearings um, uh, in, in uh, contemporaneous notes taken, uh, what he said was, when he set the parameters, he said, if a detainee dies, you're doing it wrong. Uh, and, and the lawyer explained uh, that when you're waterboarded, it's basically a mock execution, it's drowning. And your body will react as if you're drowning. And he explained how your lymphatic gland will think you're drowning, um, uh, but you won't drown. But you better have a doctor there just in case uh, medical officers present. Uh, and, and so that was um, kind of the signal to me um, that we're going to torture. And actually, um, less than, uh, that was in October, uh, by November, Ghoul Rockman died in the CIA, a black site, uh, naked from the waist down, uh, froze to death, hypothermia, in one of those dark, dank, enhanced interrogation technique uh, prisons uh, that the CIA was running. And so my, while I couldn't stop the CIA, I felt a duty and obligation to stop the spread within the Department of Defense. And so it didn't matter to me uh, if I was told the President authorized the CIA to do something. Um, the military members are still bound by the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Um, and, and we have a duty and obligation uh, not to obey unlawful orders. 
Um, and so when I was told that the Secretary of Defense had authorized these things, uh, my position was um, I have a duty and obligation not to follow what I believe to be an unlawful order, and that I had a duty and obligation to try to stop that um, however I could. Uh, and, and so that was that, um, you know, as we say, uh, again, not uh, literally, but figuratively, uh, we always tell uh, our people, you have to decide, is this the hill you're willing to die on? I mean, you fall on your sword. Is that the sword I'm willing to fall, fall on? And for me, uh, that was that moment. That was the, um, I don't care if my career is at stake. Uh, you know, I, 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 I cannot condone this. And I have a responsibility to those that I lead to ensure that they're insulated from doing this. So, so that was my come to Jesus moment or the moment when I had to decide what was really truly important to me. Um, and, and would I give up that job I loved um, and that career that I loved to do so? And I, and I had these talks um, with, uh, with the commander of the task force was an army colonel, a dear friend of mine, Britton Mallow, who unfortunately took his own life last February. Um, well, Britt and I had those discussions as leaders. You know, what do we do? I mean, you know, we were working for the Secretary of Defense. We're reporting back to the Office of Secretary of Defense, and we're having other generals. We're told that this is authorized. Um, how do we stop this? I mean, what can we do? Are we willing to be relieved? Are, are, Britt, are you willing to you can be brought before court-martial? Somebody could say you're, you're disobeying a lawful order, and we'd have to challenge the lawfulness of that order, but for us, uh, that was the moment in time, and it was actually uh, in November when I realized we were really going to do it. When it was called, uh, they changed the title. The editor didn't like the title, but I called the first chapter that chapter and booked a November to remember, because that was that was the moment when uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff um, had approved uh, torture of Katani, and, and so that was the moment that I, I knew that um, I would have to do something more than just complain. And, uh, you know, I, I have like a hundred more questions. <laughs> um, but I want to let some other people ask some questions. Uh, so let me say, before I give the floor over to other people, you know, just how much I appreciate you taking the time to, to come here to speak with us, but also just to take the stand that you did. I, I've met um, and um, spoken at length with former DT. The reason they respect their is that there are people like you who understand what you did. So I, I think we all owe Mark uh, our gratitude and a round of applause. Okay, just so I can screw the camera a little bit. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, this is kind of a long question, but I was wondering if you have any advice for people who are considering going into the military or something like that. Hold and fat? <laughs> 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 no, what's the advice you have? You know, the career path I chose is not for everyone, uh, and there's a lot of sacrifice. Uh, that goes along with that, and I and I, I, I write a little bit about that in, in my book, and I like to tell stories because I think that's an interesting way to kind of answer questions. And so, uh, I'll tell you a story, and I told it to, to some of the classes today. And so I'm on I'm on the the phone with my editors, and they're talking about some of the things I did, and and so I was we're trying to t what what do we include in the book? Is it more a, bo a book about my NCIS career, or, or is it more a book about terrorism? And so at one point we were talking about, uh, the editors actually said, torture's a dead issue. This is before the Republicans were campaigning under a war crime platform. Donald Trump was saying we should waterboard it worse. But, so at the time they were saying, torture's dead. Right about NCIS, everyone loves a TV show, so talk about some of the things. So one of the chapters I was talking about was when I was undercover in Thailand in this compound of this drug lord um, that I had you know, bought, bought some heroin from. You know, waiting for the 
Thai police to hop over the wall and rescue me. And, and um, I hung up the phone and my wife was sitting there and she said, I don't know you. And so my first response was, are you been watching Oprah again? <laughs> Will you stop watching Oprah? And I mean, this is a woman I've been married to for 30 some odd years, I think it's 37 now. I mean, our, uh, our, you know, I knew her, went to the same elementary school, the same grammar school, went to the same high school. Her fathers were partners in the police department and she's saying she doesn't know me. And, and, and so, um, so, so I had to kind of uh, compartmentalize my life. So there was the federal agent, Mark Fallon, and there was the daddy, Mark Fallon, or I have a granddaughter now, the poppy, Mark Fallon. And, and so um, there's a lot of sacrifice uh, that you have to make if you want to pursue the career path I did and do it well. Uh, you can do certain jobs uh, because they look interesting, but for me, uh, it was a calling. I mean, it, it's what, as a kid your age, I wanted, I wanted to fight crime. And I wanted to, to protect uh, good guys from bad guys. Uh, and, and so um, if that's what you want to do, uh, just realize that th there's, it, it's, there's sacrifices. Uh, I've lived now in Georgia for more than 10 years. It's the longest I've lived anywhere since high school. And I had a son that was born in the Philippines. We lived in the Philippines. We lived in Italy. Uh, you moved around a lot. Uh, I've been in helicopters and planes and submarines and all those sorts of things. So it was a good, I mean, there was no better choice for me. Uh, I mean, I was meant to be an NCIS agent or NCIS was meant to be the organization for me. So for me, it was a wonderful fit. For other people, maybe not so much. And, and so my advice to some of your ages, and this was my advice to my son, who at one point thought that he wanted to be an agent, and he came down an intern at the Phil Marshall Training Center, I had to talk with him, because he, he talked about cooking a lot, and he loved to cook. And so I asked my son, do you really want to be an NCIS agent? I said, well, it was good for you. I said, I'm not sure that's really a good enough reason. What do you really like to do? He said, I like to cook. And so right now he cooks. He, he's a kitchen manager in a restaurant and does it all. And so he's pursuing what he enjoys and what he wants to do. If he didn't really want to be an NCIS agent, he probably would not have been a very good one because you have, you give up a lot to do to do things. Did you have your hand up? Well, I was going to ask to what is there data that would show to what extent if any the way we're treating enemy combatants reflects on how our people in the military would be treated when they capture. Is it naive to think that? If we're using on them, they'll change the culture a bit? Or? Well, the, the, the difference is uh, a, a number of things. Well, first thing, and what I hope I clarify with the book was the stands taken within the military against torture. Uh, and so while I opposed it as an individual, while I opposed it uh, as a leader and the deputy commander, the chief operating officer, uh, of a, a task force. Uh, my organization, NCIS, opposed it as an institution. And we brought it to the General Counsel of the Navy. And, and when the senior judge advocate generals, the senior lawyers for each of the military services uh, heard about what Donald Rumsfeld wanted to do, the head military lawyers all opposed it. Um, and, and so part of their argument was, if we do not observe the Geneva Conventions, it makes our troops less safe. And, and, and not that Al-Qaeda would treat them any better, but if we do this as a military force, we now sanction every other military to do this. So how do we then now say to Russia, you can't do this, you do this. How do you say to China, you can't do this. And, and so it was opposed because it makes, it, it, it's more dangerous for our service members. Uh, and, and so that type of data is there. The other data, and to go back to your friend Tom Cotton's uh, arguments there, and, and so, and I, and I often give talks about how we need to move from matching tactics with tactics to matching tactics with strategies. Uh, and so, at the time, you heard Tom Cotton talk about uh, so how many people were at Guantanamo on September 11th and how many on 
12th of October, um, and there were none, obviously, because we didn't have a hook prison at that time. Um, but at the time of the coal attack and the time of September 11th, uh, if you ask someone like me um, how many Al-Qaeda members there were, probably two to 400. Al-Qaeda was two to 400 people. How many tens of thousands of violent extremists do we have now? How many people want to kill us now? How more dangerous is it now for our people in Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria or wherever they're at now? And so um, I, I just spoke last week. I, I was part of a press conference. Uh, the CCR, the Center for the Constitutional Rights, is filing suit um, uh, uh, against the, the Trump administration. I was part of a press conference there. And there was a rally outside the, the White House, and I was asked to speak at it. It was a closed Guantanamo rally. It was the anniversary when the first uh, prisoners arrived there on January 11th. Um, and and I, I gave an interview to the, the cameraman from the AP, and uh, USA Today broadcast it uh, as well. And I said, Donald Trump's uh, methodology to fight fire with fire, uh, that's the talk of an arsonist. Uh, you don't match fire with fire. You, you match it by depriving it of oxygen. Uh, and so if you want to counter violent extremism, if we want to have less people who want to kill us, if we want to make it more safe for us, particularly when we travel, we need to deprive the oxygen, the violent extremism, the oxygen that they use, the fuel that burns inside them with rhetoric like we're going to waterboard, we're going to do worse. Uh, and, and, and so uh, what, what, I, what I think is we need to be an alternative to what they're doing not a competitor to what they're doing. And, and, and so what has amazed me um, is hearing from uh, some of the prisoners who were actually at Guantanamo. Uh, and, and so I shared this story uh, with Dan and, and some others. And so one of the guys I write about in the book is uh, uh, um, uh, Slahi, uh detainee 760. We all knew them by their numbers because the names were so so confusing for, for some. Uh, and, and so Slahi was the second guy uh, we tortured pretty badly at Guantanamo uh, based on these seer uh, type methodologies. Um, and and Katani uh, was released. And right now, we have 41 people at Guantanamo right now. And we had almost 800, uh, seven, whatever the number was. Uh, and, and so that's what we're down to. So, so I don't know what Tom Cotton's talking about. Um, but we released all those people because you know, we didn't have anything that they did to hold against them. Um, but, but anyway, Katani um, had Skyped in to a book talk I was giving up in New York City uh, and was on the video. And here's a guy who was tortured, at least he's in, he's in Mauritania right now. Uh, and, and Slahi said, uh, while he hates his torturers and he thinks they need to be accountable, what a great country the United States is. What a great country America is because Mark Fallon can sit there and speak out against his government. And he could say this is wrong. And I've got Mohammed uh, al Qatani, a former Al Qaeda guy who was tortured at Guantanamo, who, who was tweeting, read unjustifiable means, means or read Mark Fallon's book. Uh, and, and so uh, here's a guy who has a message of peace. Uh, and, and, I, and, and I'm just, uh, I, I'm heartened by his humanity. I don't think I would be that forgiving, knowing what was done to him. Um, and, and so um, I spoke out, I spoke in Paris, France in, in February, and, and there were uh, a couple guys there, uh, Nasir Sazi and Murad Bechamelli, who were at Gitmo as well. Um, and and uh, Sazi is, is kind of a militant looking guy, you know, from the Western perspective, you know, has a beard and dark complected, and, uh, and, and, and he, he speaks, uh, uh, very harsh and very abruptly. I mean, that's just his style. And, and I show a videotape of him speaking out against what happened to him in Guantanamo. He's got the microphone and he's a strong, shopping guy. And I say, imagine if I met him on the street. Imagine if I met him in Sazi, what do you think of me? And then I show a picture of he and I in a bar with arms around each other, smiling. And saying, they're just people. They're human beings. And, and, and so, if you treat them like human beings, uh, you, you kind of um, you interrupt their narrative. Uh, you, you have them change the way they think of, of us, and we need to change the way we, we think of them. And, and so that's 
you know, that, that, that's kind of one of the messages and things that, that, that I've seen there that's been rather remarkable. And, and so I, I think when, when guys like that can forgive, and they're out there now going to high schools and saying to, 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 to kids in France, don't go down the pathway. I was tricked. I was misled. Don't, don't go down that, that, that pathway that I did.